Funding for Vegas Strong, Connecting During COVID-19 is provided by Vegas Strong Resiliency Center, which is managed and operated by Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada. Years ago, 58 people were killed at the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival. Denise Berditis is one of our angels and she passed away in my truck on the way to the hospital and, and her husband was there holding her the whole time. I didn't know her then, but I know her now. It's a night that changed us. It was such an overwhelming time with all of the things that had been happening. This third anniversary falls during a global pandemic. We can't all come together like we used to. All of our concerts have been canceled this year and that was a great place where we would all come together and just be together. So finding ways to connect is even more crucial. Being able to talk to somebody in your primary language, it's very important. As is finding pathways to heal. I think the one thing that I learned and the world learned as a result after 1 October that we have an incredibly resilient and proud community. And knowing that while we may be apart, we will remain. Vegas strong, Vegas strong. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Mitch Truswell. On October 1st, 2017, 58 lives were lost at the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival in Las Vegas. An estimated 22,000 people were there that night, but thousands of others were impacted as well. Every year on October 1st, survivors, family members, and the community have come together to recognize the tragedy. But like many things, this year, is different. I was supposed to be here for Garth Brooks, and thanks to our, thanks to COVID-19, Garth is now coming in February. For this group of one October survivors, the Garth Brooks concert at Allegiant Stadium is one of many concerts that have been postponed or canceled the past few months. We were all either at Route 91 together or met afterwards, and concerts is our thing. Music brought us together that night keeps bringing us together. Connie Long and Shauna Bartlett didn't know each other that night, but in the weeks, months, and years that followed, though they live in different states, the two have become the best of friends, and attending concerts together has become a sort of therapy. For a long time, it, it was hard for me to say survivor. I didn't believe I was a survivor because I wasn't injured that night. It was hard to be able to say that out loud to myself, that I actually did survive. I ran for my life. Returning to Vegas is a sort of therapy too. Unknowingly, that, that worst thing that ever happened, a piece of you stays. And you want to come back here to feel it, to find it. So together, Connie and Shauna organized a first anniversary event for survivors to gather at a local Las Vegas park. The second year, it was at the Hard Rock. Come up on the third year, and then we have COVID. And so we have all these big plans. No one will let us schedule anything. So um, I'm, I'm kind of grasping at straws. Like, what can we do? We have to do this. People are, are asking. Um, and it's part of my healing, is bringing everyone together. The events have brought connections. I can't tell you how many times I have either watched someone say, you were next to me that night. Oh my gosh, I I'm so glad you're okay. Or, wait, I was running with you that night. I'm so glad you're here. And healing. The emotions are already starting. About a month before you start to have the anxiety again. It's, it's coming up, it's coming up, that day is coming. And no matter what this year brings, they will find a way to unite and remember. I don't think that people realize how big this country music family is. 
we come in a force. I think a lot of us believe that while it's hard to say that we made it through that night, we can make it through anything. I'm joined by Tanil Pereira, director of the Vegas Strong Resiliency Center, as well as Lori Lytell, a licensed clinical social worker who has been working with survivors since day one. I want to thank both of you for joining us here today. Tanil, for those that don't know, what is the Resiliency Center? The Resiliency Center is a a uh, center that was set up in the aftermath of the one October shooting, um, essentially as a resource hub uh, for whatever resources that those impacted by one October need. Um, so we really meet them wherever they are, wherever they are in that healing journey and uh, connect them to the resources that they need or navigate the system for them uh, on their behalf. Right before this pandemic hit, you move locations. We did. Uh, we moved into this new beautiful location to be able to provide in-person services and events because they were asking for that human connection, for that in-person interaction. Then the quarantine hit and we all got sent home to work from home and we were no longer uh, able to see them in person. We were planning open houses and showing off the new space. Now we're all working remotely but we are all still available. Everything inside the brand new office space for the Vegas Strong Resiliency Center is still. The center is temporarily closed to the public, but the work continues. We have been offering information sessions and groups and other ways to offer information, ways to connect, and just various platforms and various types of therapy, types of treatment, types of integrative services like yoga, self-regulation, calming, breathing. Like many agencies during this COVID-19 crisis, the majority of resources have gone virtual. My background is in counseling and I have been studying resilience for years. Alice Goldstein volunteers as a virtual support group leader. Why is it particularly important to connect during this time when we can't connect one-on-one. -on -one. Wow, during this pandemic time, everybody is just feeling so alone. And for, for people who are about, you know, they're just trying to figure out a new normal. And then to have this whole thing where you can't go anywhere or see anyone, you know, for some, it, it, it provided a sense of relief. And for others, it triggered a whole bunch of other, I'm out of control feelings which is why finding ways to connect in new and different ways is so important. This support group isn't intended to substitute for therapy. Uh, everybody that comes in is already seeing a therapist or they've been in therapy for a while. So this is just an adjunct to what they're already doing. The Resiliency Center is found by going virtual, survivors in other states and even countries have access to groups and resources that they may not have had before. Sometimes the virtual opportunities give them a way to build their readiness. They can just sit in and listen and hear other people or hear more about the healing process and recognize where they are in that journey. And while the help may be virtual for now, the impact is real. We are still learning all of the time. And we've learned a lot over the last three years but we know that we will continue to learn from everyone who has a different way of coping. I know that anniversaries, when they come up um, for traumatic events, those can obviously be a trigger. This year, it's going to be a little bit different. Some of the activities that happened in the past, people can't attend and feel the community come together in support of them. What would you say about that as the anniversary is here? Well, I, I think what's important for survivors and anybody who's grieving or mourning or more anxious is to figure out something to do for themselves. We can't do what we were going to do because of COVID. But for instance, for somebody that lost somebody, maybe they've created an altar or a space in their home, or maybe they decide this is the year that they want to buy, you know, one of those uh, bricks that you can buy to um, to put under a tree in one of our local parks. Whatever it is, um, I would encourage people to do something for themselves to acknowledge it because to not acknowledge the anniversary doesn't help. It bounces back on you. I'll never forget it. 
Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak was among those who walked the concert site the morning after 1 October. I remember walking along and hearing a cell phone that was laying on the ground ringing and just thinking to myself, that's a family member or a friend trying to get a hold of someone. And I don't know if that person lived, if that person died. It was just uh, changed my life. As then chair of the Clark County Commission, he witnessed the worst of humanity and also the best as the community rallied together. So many acts of kindness, so many great acts that were done and energies that were brought forward to help people. And I think it raised our awareness. Uh, I think it raised our common sense, our sensitivity to the situation that other folks are in. In the weeks that followed 1 October, there were quilt drives, a portrait exhibit, and of course, the crosses. One cross for every life lost. There have also been remembrances, like Clark County's sunrise ceremony, held at daybreak every 1 October morning. Clark County Commissioner Jim Gibson. What we discovered after uh, the October 1 event was that we were far better than we really knew we were uh, as an entire community, as a greater community of people. Uh, we found that uh, there was within us all uh, this uh, notion that we're there for someone else. We can do something to help. Next we can move to item number 59, which is to receive an update on 1 October Memorial Committee. Plans are underway for a permanent memorial. One thing that we've learned from other states is it's not a rush to the finish line. We want to do it right. There's so many different components, so many different ways that we can go. So we established a task force uh, and we will have a facilitator because it's going to be very emotional for many on what that memorial looks like. As for the governor. Everybody did what they could do. They did that then and they're doing it now and, and that's a good thing. It shows what a great community we are. Why is it important to recognize anniversaries? Because it validates the community experience, it validates individuals experience, it honors those that gave up, you know, so much. It honors those that lost so much. Um, not acknowledging uh, the anniversary can feel like we're not saying that we've forgotten and we haven't forgotten. This is my church without walls. This is where I come anytime I'm, I need to reflect, just take care of the garden and find my peace here. The Las Vegas Community Healing Garden is like a second home for Route 91 concert goer Sue Ann Cornwell. So this is Denise Berditis' tree. Um, this is the lady that passed away in my truck that evening on the way to the hospital. And this tree is one of 58 trees planted to honor the 58 lives lost that night. Everybody that knows me knows that this is my tree. <laughs> you know, I take care of it. I am honored to be able to take care of Denise's tree for the family. It's just close to my heart. The garden comes from the heart of our people and the memory of that awful night, but in a calm, peaceful and beautiful way. Las Vegas Mayor Carolyn Goodman vividly remembers not only that October 1st night, but the night this garden was dedicated. We had um, dignitaries from Nevada that came to the opening. And as I took the microphone and looked at the crowd, something caught my eye. And I looked up dead ahead from where I was standing. And this picture was taken of what I saw. And I stopped. I looked for a plane, because you would think that's a jet trail. But it was, there was no plane before I stopped. And I said, everyone, please stand up and turn around. And it, you could hear this, oh. I mean, it was such an emotional, ethereal moment. You just, it was calming and you thought, oh my gosh, they're here with us. You could just have that sense. There's so many people that care so much about this place. Erin Lifeheight is with Get Outdoors Nevada a nonprofit that cares for this space. A lot of people have trouble talking about their mental health, so I think to have 
this whole space designated to people's health, their physical health, their mental health, their healing, you know, to, to have a space where people can come and reflect and feel good and feel calm and feel peaceful is really a big benefit for our community. And as the trees grow, so does the garden itself, with new areas for small gatherings, yoga, or meditation. We have thousands of these, and they have, you know, Vegas Strong, uh, Home Means Nevada, Hope is where we start. For Sue Ann, volunteering at the garden has become her life's work. What's important to me is when other people come here, they can find the same peace and the same healing that I find when I come here. That's the most important thing to me. I think sometimes the public, if they think someone they know needs help, they don't know how to bring it up or the right thing to say or how to bring up that conversation. What's your advice? The baseline should be, is this person how they usually are or are they different? Um, and if you're a friend or a neighbor or a colleague or a relative and you feel like your loved one is different in, somehow, then maybe you would want to bring it up that way. Hey, you know, I know that usually you're pretty easy going and joking around and it seems like you're pretty down these days. Or I know we're all anxious because of COVID, but it seems like you haven't been out of the house in a couple of weeks. Okay. Tanil, your thoughts on that? The big thing here, I think, is they need to feel empowered. They need to feel empowered in their own healing. Um, so we can't really take over their life. We can't take over what they should be doing or be telling them what they should be doing. What we can be is there for them. Um, and don't minimize what they're going through. En estos años, este, he encontrado cinco personas de las siete que pas salvó. Angelica lost her son, Eric, on 1 October. He was working as a security guard and did what he always did, help people. That night, he helped people survive. Y pues así, este, siguen las historias cada año. Todos los años siempre hay personas que, que hablan de Eric. Angelica is just one of many impacted by 1 October who are primarily Spanish speaking. It was kind of the working crew that it was um, in the Hispanic community, they were workers. Margarita Romano is with Silver State Health. The first couple of weeks after October 1st were pretty impactful, very chaotic. A lot of people asking for help. Uh, all these working crew, because everybody ran out from the event, um, they couldn't get their belongings, they couldn't get their IDs. And uh, another uh, important factor to mention is that f for somebody that is undocumented, it's very difficult to get a, a, an official ID, like even the, from their own consulate. Silver State Health is working with Spanish-speaking survivors of 1 October, offering a wide range of resources. We have noticed an increase of asking for help from this particular group of survivors. They have been reaching out more, and because we now have the means to help them more, uh, it's, it's actually been, been very helpful that we're reconnecting with this group and we're able to provide them again with more services during this difficult times such as the pandemic. Pues la verdad, um, no he pedido ayuda, pero me han ofrecido ayuda. Angelica calls Margarita her angel. Connecting has not only helped her, but her entire family. Eric Silva was only 21 years old when he died. Pues, les voy a decir una cosa, yo eri todos los días le decía labio. Todos los días. No importa la hora, mm. No importa la hora. Él sabía que fue muy querido por nosotros. Entonces, él se fue sabiendo que nosotros lo queríamos mucho. You know, it happened three years ago. I'd love to get your perspective on why that shouldn't matter. Well, with an event of the magnitude um, of what happened here on 1 October, frankly, to be still struggling after three years is a pretty normative place to be. People always feel like something's wrong with them. Mm because they're not over it. And my point is, it's like when you go to the doctor and they hit your um, knee with that little 
a hammer and you have a, and you flex and you can't help it. Right. Well, that's what happens when we're in trauma. You have no control over it. Your brain goes into survival mode, and that's why people feel like it it's still happening sometimes, and they go back in their minds. And three years is not so long. And that timeline is individual to each person. It very much is, and anybody that has pre-existing trauma or pre-existing loss or maybe grew up in a dysfunctional family or had other sorts of difficulties, then this will be more complicated for them, right? Because nobody comes to a traumatic event without any history. We all bring our history to it. And so everybody's recovery is going to be different. Talk about first responders and the anniversary. Yeah, absolutely. They have repeated trauma right. just from their jobs, right? Um, and it's just repeated over and over and it's compounded. Um, this particular event was was huge. Um, they're our local heroes, right? right? They're always here for us day in and day out. So when things like the anniversary come up, I think they really impact them um, in ways that we don't always see because they're the strong ones. Well, you know, we, we often refer to our, our staff as the last of the first responders, right? John Fudenberg is recently retired. He spent his career in public service, including serving as the Clark County coroner. Can you describe what it was like to be coroner here on October 1? It's tough to describe that, as you would imagine, but it, uh, you know, the, the, the one October incident is one of those incidents that, that would define anybody's career. Fudenberg says the coroner's role didn't end that night or even that month. Well, we did, you know, we notified all the next of kin and, 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 um, and of course identified the decedents within about 72 hours of the incident, which is what I think is miraculous. And I'm not saying that because I'm taking no credit. It was our staff that did that. But, but you know, that's just kind of the beginning for us. When you have 58 families that, that are immediately introduced to your office, we instantly develop a bond with those family members and they maintain contact with our staff on a very regular basis. You know, our community expects us to protect them, but there's a price with being the protector. Annette Mullen heads up the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department's Police Employee Assistance Program, known as PEEP. I think one of the things that first responders typically will say is that they don't need help. Simple items like cards, stress squeezies, and online outreach has given officers the ability to seek help on their own time. I think more of our employees have learned to be connected through telephone calls, through virtual events. I've seen a great increase in our employees using resources that they haven't used in quite some time, which is encouraging. Do you still think about this incident? I do. I, I, you know, it's not something that haunts me. I don't close my eyes at night and think about it, but I think about it on, on a regular basis. Right now, I, I can tell you in retrospect, it, it, it's changed me for the better. It made me definitely appreciate uh, the good things in life appreciate the people that care for you, appreciate the people that I care for, and, and really put your priorities where they should be. You're hearing from people that were affected by 1 October that have never reached out before. Why now? Because now is the time that they were ready, right? Everyone heals in their own time, and each one of their journeys is going to be different depending on their background, um, how they were impacted, um, their support systems that were in place, their coping skills that were in place. Yeah, and with 22,000 people that were there that night, I imagine it's gonna be years before we can say all of them have reached out in some way, shape, or fashion. I imagine so, okay. yes. I imagine we'll be doing this for some time. Although 1 October happened in Las Vegas, about 65% of ticket holders that night were from Southern California. When people came home, there wasn't an immediate resource, support groups, and different things for them to grasp onto because it didn't happen in their community. Which is why outreach in California is so important. Kirsty Thompson is with the nonprofit Give an Hour. So one really unique thing about our project is something called Trauma-Informed Peer Support, the TIPS project. 
And what that is, it's a peer support project where we will invite survivors of the Route 91 incident who are interested in learning more about how to be a peer supporter to other survivors. It's easier for a survivor to talk to somebody that has been through this type of an incident than it would be to talk to somebody that hasn't been through it. The project is funded by federal dollars through the California Victims' Compensation Board for the next three years. But the hope is the connections will last much longer. We will have this cadre of peer supporters who have been trained in an evidence-informed model, and hopefully they will be able to keep you know, those groups going um, long after our project you know, is over. The goal is to reach survivors, no matter where they reside. To let people know that we did not forget. I think it's really important for people to know that. Um, we didn't forget. We won't forget. We really can't forget. This happened to our community and to our friends, and it's important that we, we remember. The Resiliency Center talks a lot about long-term healing. How would you say, Tennille, you can achieve that? One day at a time, um, you know, taking control in your own life, taking control of your own healing journey. Um, what happened was, was not okay, right? But we each have a responsibility to ourselves for our healing journey and to take the steps that are necessary to move forward. It is possible to achieve healing. Absolutely. Healing means understanding it's going to be with you forever. Great. And you can manage that and you can live with that. Wonderful. Appreciate your time, both of you. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. We put the contact information for all of the resources you saw in this program on the Vegas PBS website. That's vegaspbs.org. There you'll find additional video content as well. Thank you to those who shared their stories and expertise for this Vegas Strong special. We're gonna leave you now with singer-songwriter Kiara Brown. 58 hearts, 58 brand new stars Light up the sky tonight And this is our home We must go on Vegas strong In the darkest of nights We will join in their light And only together we will shine With strength in our love This is our home, Vegas Strong. 58 hearts, 58 brand new stars, light up the sky tonight. And this is our home, we can go on, Vegas Strong. This is my